my friends. Welcome to Origins. My name is Don Chapman. It's my privilege to be your host. You know, Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science and we use it to validate the truth of creation. Our guest today is one of my very favorite guests, the old professor from Washington University, David Minton. Dr. David, it's good to have you nice here. Nice to be here, Don. Dr. Minton was the uh, professor of anatomy studying microscopic anatomy for, uh, what did you say, 34 years? 34 years, yeah. And then you uh, got a real job. You're now <laughs> traveling with Answers in Genesis and lecturing. But today we're not going to really talk uh, about what comes under a microscope. We're going to be talking about the SCOPES trial. And would you remind our people why this is so important? Well, first of all, I think it's safe to say the SCOPES trial is America's most famous court trial and it dealt with a very, very important issue that still concerns us today. You can't pick up a copy of the newspaper without running into it. And that is the whole creation evolution controversy, particularly as it touches on our public schools. What should we be teaching our students? What role, if any, should the parents have in what we teach our students about our origins and purpose in life? And uh, you'll see that uh, the arguments really haven't changed that much since 1925 when the trial took place. This is our second show on the Scopes trial. On the first one, we, we looked at the lead up to the trial and we discovered that unlike Inherit the Wind, the movie and the play that talked about it, uh, Scopes never taught evolution. Uh, the people in town were never hostile. He never went to jail. That actually the ACLU was looking for a place to have a test case to overthrow throw a law that said that uh, you could not teach the evolution of man. Is that a pretty good summary? That's right. There uh, were several states at that time in 1925 that had uh, similar bills passed in their state legislature that basically forbid uh, teaching that man evolved from a lower order of animals and to deny the divine creation of man. It didn't forbid any other kind of evolution, just the evolution of man. The ACLU obviously didn't like that and they wanted to make these laws unenforceable so they basically initiated a test case. And today we're going to go into the courtroom and we're going to see uh, what the evidence was in that case. That's right. We'll see just exactly what constituted scientific evidence for evolution Let's at do that it. time. Well, part two, here we go, and uh, it's an interesting story. First of all, I'd like to point out that if you'd like to visit Dayton, Tennessee, and I recommend it, it's north of Chattanooga. It's up in the Cumberland Mountains, a lovely little town with wonderful people. And this is the way the courthouse appears to this day. They've preserved it, and it's very much uh, inside like it was at the time of the trial. And if you're wondering what it looked like at the time of the trial, there it is. This is July of 1925. Approximately 2,000 reporters came in from all over the world. 2,000 reporters. 65 telegraph operators alone. Most of these people got nowhere near the courthouse. In fact, most of them didn't even need to come into the courthouse because they were already told by their newspapers what to write. Wow. Basically to lampoon Christians and to make uh, creation look like foolishness and to promote evolution. One of the reasons it got such prominence was it had two of the most famous attorneys in the country there, right? Oh my goodness, yes. You couldn't have picked two hotter people to uh, argue this case. On the left there we see Clarence Darrow, uh, probably the most famous criminal lawyer in the history of uh, jurisprudence in America. He was a uh, atheist, agnostic, and very outspoken. And uh, he defended uh, John Scopes, the uh, teacher who presumably taught evolution, which as it turned out, of course, he didn't. But it was a test case, so nobody cared. And uh, he faced off with William Jennings Bryan on the right, another very famous man who had three times run for president of the United States, led the Democratic Party for 25 to 30 years, and was very well known as a Christian. And so you had the world's probably most famous atheist and most famous Christian battling it out in the courtrooms over teaching evolution in the public school. Now, John Scopes really isn't very important. He told the news media during the trial, though he asked them not to print it till after, that he never taught evolution. So that wasn't the real issue, was it? That's right. He just got roped into participating in a test case, and the ACLU picked the wrong person. But once they started with him, they had to finish. Uh, what were the real issues? Well, technically, the real issue was simply this. Did John Scopes violate the Butler Act by teaching that man has descended from a lower order of animals? Notice we're just talking about man here. We're not talking evolution from anything else. And while that technically was the only issue, in fact, both sides saw this as a test case. The guilt or innocence of Scopes meant nothing. Right. 
It was a chance for the evolutionists to give it their best shot and say why we need to teach evolution in the school, and for the creationists to say, uh, no, evolution's bad science, we don't need it. So both of these lawyers have their own agenda. Right. In fact, if you look at Brian's agenda or his objectives in the trial, he's gone on record as saying that his first uh, uh, goal was to establish the right of taxpayers to control what is taught in their schools. And uh, he felt that uh, people who paid the taxes uh, ought to have some say when it deals with their Christian convictions. And uh, secondly, he said his second objective was to draw a line between the teaching of evolution as a fact as opposed to teaching it as a theory. We never got that line drawn, did we? No, tables have turned a great deal. Yeah. Today, evolution's the only game in town, and nobody discusses what's fact and theory anymore. Uh, the third objective that Brian had was to see that any teacher that might be found guilty of violating uh, this law, that they should be given an opportunity to resign. He did not want to see them fined, and of course, he certainly didn't want to see them jailed. So he has no punitive goals of really getting someone or anything like that. Absolutely not. In fact, uh, Brian didn't see a problem with teaching evolution in the classroom. As long as you didn't teach it as a fact, as long as you presented evidence both for and against it, he thought it was a good idea. Dr. Menton, don't you think that's still what the American people want? Absolutely. Survey after survey shows that Americans would love to have students taught what's the evidence for evolution, what's the evidence against it. But to listen to the evolutionists, there is no evidence against it. And all scientists agree. Well, that's what they say. <laughs> and what about Darrow? He had his own objectives in participating in the trial. He said in his uh, autobiography, The Story of My Life, he said, my object and my only object was to focus the attention of the country on the program of Mr. Bryan and the other fundamentalists in America. So he was gunning for fundamentalists to now, discredit now, them. Again, uh, we, we covered this in the last show. I don't want to park here, but I do want to point out that if there's anybody who had angst or, or bitterness that, 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 was, that shows in their statements, it's certainly not Brian, it's Darrow who comes in here saying, I, I don't like Christians and I want to make them look bad. And, and uh, th there's charity in Brian's statement. There's nothing but anger and bitterness in da Darrow's statement. Well, to give you an idea what level of the anger uh, was achieved there, Darrow repeatedly insulted not only the jury, but the judge, Judge Ralston, and was cited for contempt of court and the American Civil Liberties Union decided they didn't want to use him in any appeal because he'd already created so much hostility. Uh, the World Council of Churches was fed up with him. I mean, they loved his liberal uh, point of view, uh, but he was so hostile to Christianity uh, that they didn't let him play a role in the appeal. Of you know, when I read some of the uh, popularized atheists who are writing books uh, defending evolution today, it's not their facts that wow me, it's the, de it's the depth of their anger and vitriol that amaze me. Right, and speaking of facts, let's just look at what, in quotes, the facts are. Good. Here you see in the picture evolution. In evolution, everything's supposed to evolve uh, from a, a single primordial cell and to form fish and plants and uh, birds and uh, mammals and finally uh, people. And all of this is supposed to branch out by a mindless, purposeless process of mutations and natural selection. Was this actual drawing used in the trial? Uh, no, this is a, is a drawing that uh, I just picked up out of the textbooks to give the basic idea of sure. macroevolution. So it's the concept, not the actual Now, the drawing. evidence yeah. for this is very, very poor, and they knew that. Yes. So what they did is they took something for which we have very good evidence, and that's the development of human beings from a fertilized egg. They substituted that for evolution. Okay. And said, if we don't teach our students in the schools evolution, they will not know how the baby forms in the womb. Now, I know this sounds outrageous and that <laughs> it's, it's hard to believe, but let's actually look at how the defense, speaking first of the lawyers, equated embryology with evolution. Now, this is what we're talking about. What you're seeing in the picture here is an egg, an egg cell, not yet fertilized, okay. and when a sperm enters that uh, egg, uh, penetrates in, you have the chromosomes from the male and the female combined for the first time, and from that moment on, we call that conception, you have a new individual. Right. And that divides into two cells, four, eight, uh, arms, legs develop, uh, baby emerges uh, nine months later, if everything goes to term. Uh, they tried to argue that this is what evolution is all about. If you believe this, then you believe that man evolved from an expanding cloud of hydrogen gas through a mindless and purposeless process of random mutation and natural selection. 
It sounds incredible, but let's look at the defense. On the left there, you see Judge Ralston, and uh, on his left uh, is Clarence Darrow, and then the other lawyers for the defense of John Scopes. Uh, Ralston was getting confused. He could see something wasn't right. What does the embryology, the development of a human being, have to do with evolution? So Judge Ralston asked Clarence Darrow, are you telling us that all life on Earth all came from one starting cell? Darrow's response to Judge Ralston was, and I quote, well, I'm not quite so clear, but I think it did. All human life comes from one cell. You came from one cell, and I came from one, nothing else a single cell. So you see what he did? He brought it right back to the development of babies from a fertilized egg. But he wasn't asked, do you believe people come from a fertilized egg? He was asked, do you believe all life come from one cell? He was a good he, lawyer. So you say, well, that was just one of the lawyers. Well, let's look at Arthur Garfield Hayes, another lawyer for the defense. This is what he said in the trial, and I quote, and this is right out of the trial transcript, page 156. He said, I know that in the womb of the mother, the very first thing is a cell, and that cell grows and it subdivides and it grows into a human being, and a human being is born. Does that statement, as the boy stated on the stand, that he was taught that man comes from a cell, is that a theory that man descended from a lower order of animals? I don't know, and I dare say your honor has some doubt about it. Are we entitled to find out whether it is or not in presenting this case to the jury? What about Dudley Field Malone? Same thing. He said, and I quote, the embryo becomes a human being when it is born. Now that's interesting. Here's a Roman Catholic who said you're not a human being until you're born. Evolution never stops from the beginning of the one cell until a human being returns in death to lifeless dust. He's even equating evolution now with aging. Yes. We wish to set before you evidence of this character in order to stress the importance of the theory of evolution. So they were determined to make this connection that if, if human beings within the womb go from one cell to a, to a whole person, that somehow proves that all of life came from one single cell on earth. And they just did that by doing that over and over and over again. Is that the picture? Absolutely. Okay. And, uh, you know, we can say today that, well, that's just lawyers talking and uh, lawyers may be uh, willfully uh, misled because they want to win their case. Or you could say you wouldn't expect them to know a lot about science. But the question comes up, what about the experts? There were experts there. We've got to take a break, but you hold that thought. When we come back, we'll see what the experts had to say, so don't go away. Today's guest on Origins, anatomist Dr. David Menton, is a speaker for Answers in Genesis. Audiences enjoy his well-illustrated presentations on a variety of fascinating topics. Many of these lectures are available on DVD. If you're interested in the subject of creation, you'll definitely want these for your own. Orders are being taken at 800-778-3390. You can also write to Answers in Genesis, PO Box 510, Hebron, Kentucky, 41048. Or visit the website at www.answersingenesis.org. We're back with Dr. David Menton, and we're talking about the Scopes trial. And Dr. Menton, when we went to our break, we were talking about the lawyers and how they took the study of embryology, how one cell develops in a womb into an entire human being, and somehow they equated that with all of life on Earth coming from a single cell. I don't get the connection, but it seemed to be working in the trial, but that's just lawyer talk. When we get the experts on the stand, did they bring any more viable evidence? The experts were never allowed to address the jury because technically the issue is not whether evolution is true or not, uh, but uh, whether Scopes violated the law or not. That was technically the issue. Uh, so uh, both sides seemed to agree that they wanted to have it out over the scientific evidence. And the main line of evidence presented uh, by uh, the defense was of the nature you've just seen. And even the experts, who while they didn't testify to the jury, they put in deposition 
Oh, their okay. So it's written, it's written evidence submitted. That's right. And one of them spoke uh, to uh, everybody but the jury. <laughs> and so this all went into deposition. To give you an idea where the scientific community went with this whole issue, let's consider one of the key players among the experts that you see here uh, pictured. Uh, this expert is Dr. Maynard Metcalf. He was a professor at Johns Hopkins University. He was an expert on evolution. And uh, he was first asked, what are your credentials, Dr. Metcalf, for coming here and, and telling us about evolution? And this is what Dr. Metcalf said, zoologist from Johns Hopkins, and I quote from the trial transcript, page 136. He said, I have always been particularly interested in the evolution of the individual organism from the egg and also the evolution of the organism as a whole from the beginning of life that, and now he's talking about aging, that has been a sort of a peculiar interest of mine, always. So Don't, we're not really talking about evolution here at all, are we? Absolutely not. Yeah. Now, the judge was really getting confused. Judge Ralston hardly knew what side was up at this point. I mean, here are experts that are bringing this in. And so what he did is he asked Dr. Metcalf, would you please define precisely what it is you mean when you use this expression, the fact of evolution. Now, what I'm going to read for you comes right out of the trial transcript. Okay. It's written as one sentence. <laughs> I don't think I can read it all as one sentence, but I'm going to give it a try. Remember, this is the fact of evolution by a Johns Hopkins expert. He said, Evolution, I think, means the change in the final analysis. I think it means the change of an organism from one character into a different character, and by character I mean its structure, its behavior, its function, or its method of development from the egg or anything else, the change of an organism from one set characteristic which characterizes it into a different condition characterized by a different set of characteristics, either structural or functional, could be properly called, I think, evolution to be the evolution of that organism, but the term in general means the whole series of such changes which have taken place during hundreds of millions of years, which have produced from lowly beginnings, the nature of which is not by any means fully understood, to organism of much more complex character whose structure and function we're still studying because we haven't <laughs> begun to learn what we need to know about them. Think of it. <laughs> that is the fact of evolution. No wonder everybody was totally oh, confused. Oh, my. Well, they just about broke the floor down. Uh, throughout the trial, what Darrow did was to bring up all kinds of miracles from the Bible and challenge Brian with these miracles. And he, he loved to make fun of the miracles. And Brian did an excellent job because what he did is whenever he got challenged with one of the miracles of the Bible, he would just simply quote what the Bible says. And that put Darrow in the position of saying basically the fool Bible, ignore it, it's wrong. And uh, that was a very successful approach on his part but he finally fell apart. Darrow had a question up his sleeve, being the rascal that he was, that caught Brian short. And that question is this one. Darrow asks, do you think the earth was made in six days? Brian responded, this is right from the transcript, page 298 and 299. Brian said, not in six days of 24 hours. So Darrow comes back, doesn't it say so? That is in the Bible. Brian says, no, sir. Doesn't say that in the Bible. Darrow then makes a statement. This is so sad, I can hardly bear to read it, Don. You have to remember, this is an atheist talking to a Bible-believing Christian. And this atheist says, does the statement, the morning and evening were the first day and the morning and evening were the second day mean anything to you? Quoting right from Scripture, does this mean anything to you? And Brian came back with this. I do not see that there's any necessity for constructing the words, the evening and morning is meaning necessarily. A 24-hour day. Well, Darrow had him. Darrow says, so the creation might have been going on for a very long time, huh? And Brian says, it might have continued for millions of years. Now, you know the interesting thing here, this is a point where Brian got bamboozled into taking the witness stand as an expert for creation and Christianity. His co-counsel says, don't do it, Darrow will get you. But he agreed to do it with the understanding that Darrow would come in the next day and take the witness stand as an expert on atheism and evolution, <laughs> or agnosticism. But Darrow came in the next day and instructed the 
court to find his client guilty as charged, he conceded his guilt, which brought the whole trial to the end, and he didn't have to take his turn on stage. But what he succeeded in doing by getting Brian to capitulate on the days of the earth, he said, well, see, there you go. Science trumps the Bible. You don't have to take it at its word. When the speculations of man run counter to the teachings of the Bible, stick with what man says. Well, Brian was a wonderful Christian, but uh, I think he let the pride get the best of him when he got on the stand. To make a long story short, Scopes was found guilty. He was fined $100. Imprisonment was never a provision of uh, this bill. Uh, he was fined $100, and it was subsequently overturned because it was supposed to be the jury that decided the fine, not the judge. And finally, the whole uh, Butler Act uh, was uh, thrown out uh, in 1967 in the state of Tennessee. And today, just as in any other state, evolution is taught dogmatically in the public schools, and no one dare teach creation. Well, this is the last photo of William Jennings Bryan. It was taken on the day of his death. He died five days after the trial. He had been suffering from diabetes, which was largely untreated in those days. He'd even been hit by a car once as a pedestrian. Mm. He went around giving lectures, helped locate land to build William Jennings Bryan College in Dayton, Tennessee. And uh, he died, and uh, this is his last picture, uh, a wonderful man. And uh, uh, he certainly fought for the faith, even though he may have failed in some aspects. Dr. Men, the trial is fascinating, and I appreciate your research and you sharing this with me. But you're a creation scientist. I want to put you on the stand, and I want to ask you the same question. Do you think the Earth was made in six 24-hour days? Absolutely. You know, uh, we understand the word day in any one of three possible ways. It could mean uh, day versus night. It could mean an ordinary 24-hour day, or it could mean a broad period of time. And we determine what is meant by the context in, what it's, in which it's written. And in Genesis, we have a number for each of the days. That always means an ordinary day. It's mentioned as having an evening and morning, which was the Jewish way of indicating a day. And Jesus Christ believed that it was a day. Uh, he said in six days, God created everything and rested on the seventh. So uh, I'm inclined to take the Bible just as it reads. Have you found any evidence in science that would seem contrary to the fact that God created the world in six days? No, you know, when we look at the fossil record, everything just appears suddenly. Right. You, you, for example, take bats. They're a very unusual creature. Their legs are on backwards. Their knees face to the rear rather than the front. Uh, they have very distinctive skull with grooves in to channel the sonar to navigate, you know, by sonar to navigate. And when you look in the fossil record, uh, the first bats you see are 100% bat. There is no such thing as a pre-bat. <laughs> and that's typical of everything we see in the fossil record. And so you're very confident that we have a God big enough and we have evidence that validates the fact that we have a young earth and that God made it, as he said, in six days. Absolutely. You know, God doesn't need any time at all to create. In fact, back in the early Reformation, the time of Martin Luther, the issue wasn't that God took longer than six days. Many people are inclined to think he took less time, uh, specifically one day. And the reason they believe that is that, look, God doesn't need any time at all to create. He just speaks and it is. That's right. He's the creator of time. That's right. So he would arbitrarily assess a time, and everybody thought it would be more reasonable for one day rather than six. <laughs> I myself am not entirely sure why God dilly-dallied for six whole days. I, I don't care why he did. <laughs> I just know he's big enough to have done it in one second, a millisecond, six years, or six million years. But the fact is, the record that God left it says he did it in six days, so I believe he did it in six days. Absolutely. You know, it's not an issue of what could God have done. It's what the issue did. is, what did he say he did? You know, I would just challenge you to put your faith in our God and in his word and trust him. And you'll find that science doesn't contradict that. It validates the truth. You know, it's been true since creation, and it's true today. It's God's view that he created you, and that should be your worldview too. Hold on to the truth until we see you next time, and God bless you.
Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file of program number 1003 from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins, program number 1003, Cornerstone Television, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and the financial support of you, our Cornerstone Television family.